Okay, welcome everyone. We shall uh, commence now. We'll just to let you know this event uh, is being uh, recorded. Um, so yeah, good afternoon. Hope uh, you're all well and welcome to this event, which has been organised by the Grantham Institute as part of Imperial College's Sustainability Week. My name's Neil and I work at the Grantham Institute as Partnership Development Manager and I'll be chairing the event today. Um, and today is uh, the fifth of the, the uh, days of the Imperial Sustainability Week and it's themed around nature and biodiversity. And we're delighted to bring you an event focused on preserving nature while protecting the environment. So it's gonna to look to explore the interrelationships between climate change and biodiversity loss and highlight areas where there may be risks of trade-offs um, and also hopefully provide examples of where there can be win-win-win opportunities that help climate, nature and people at the same time. So in terms of housekeeping, I mentioned this event is being recorded and it will be available on the Grantham YouTube channel next week. As we go through the event, please do use the chat function to post your questions um, and uh, obviously uh, make sure you're respectful when you do so with any questions or, or, or comments. Uh, if you're tweeting about the event, please remember to tag us. So at Grantham underscore IC. Um, live captions will appear as an option uh, for people who are on Zoom if requested. And really pleased to say we're very lucky to be joined by a panel of four experts today from Imperial who are each going to present for seven to eight minutes on a particular aspect of the interrelationship between climate change and nature. And following those, those presentations, we'll then go into a question and answer session. So please do post your questions as we go along in the chat. Um, uh, if you submitted a question when you signed up, we've got those recorded and so there's no need to, to repost them. So just to, to run through our four speakers, um, Dr. Bonnie Waring uh, will be our first speaker. She's a senior lecturer at the Grantham Institute for Climate Change and the Environment here at Imperial. And Bonnie's laboratory, the Waring Ecology Lab, investigates how the ecology of plant and soil microbial communities influence the carbon cycle and its feedback on climate change. So really strong intersection between uh, ecology and uh, climate change. The second speaker will be Alvaro Royal Bellot. Uh, and Alvaro, Alvaro is a PhD student carrying out interdisciplinary research on ecosystem restoration. He holds a BSc in biology from the University of Alicante in Spain and a MSc in conservation science from Imperial. He's currently based at the Centre for Environmental Policy at Imperial under the supervision of Dr. Morena Mills. Our third speaker will be Emily Lewis-Brown, who's a PhD candidate at the Grantham Institute. Uh, Emily studying the social drivers and barriers of the spread of conservation initiatives and her BSc masters and working life have focused on environmental protection and restoration as she previously worked at the World Wildlife Fund at WWF and advised the United Nations Environment Programme patron of the ocean on marine and climate protection and on restoration for over a decade. And our fourth speaker is Dr Tilly Collins who is a senior fellow and deputy director of Imperial's Centre for Environmental Policy um, and in the world of specialists, uh, Tilly's unusual to the extent in that she's uh, a generalist. She's passionate about trees, insects and green spaces, and is particularly interested in the intersection between social systems, agriculture and ecology. She's got a diverse set of research interests, which have, have a common theme of using well-gathered data to advise sustainable systems and support decision making. So those are our four fantastic speakers. And um, before handing over to the first of our speakers, Bonnie, We'd like to start off with a quick poll just to kind of get, get things going and, uh, and to see who's in the room and how you're feeling. So we have a, a couple of questions, uh, if we could just bring those up now. So the first is a bit of a lighthearted question. The poll should appear on your screen very shortly. Um, uh, and so the first of the questions is, uh, which of these animals do you feel like at the, at the moment? Uh, so not to say these are exclusive and you may all be feeling more like some, some than others or more than one at once. But we have what we thought as being a, an alert eagle, uh, a worried polar bear, an excited puppy, or indeed a sloth, bearing in mind that it is almost the end of the week after all. So cast your vote. And after that, there's a, you'll see a second question, which is whether you've ever bought something where a company promised to plant a tree on your behalf. So two quite different questions, it's fair to say. One just to kind of see how you're feeling and the other just to get an idea of some of this kind of intersection between um, some of the choices we make and uh, consequences for, for ecosystems in terms of some of the promises being made by, by companies that we may buy products from. Okay, so I can see on my screen we've had about, we've had 16 people uh, respond so far. So we have lots of owls so far, lots of you hopefully feeling alert and, and looking to absorb and learn. Uh, Sloth is coming in in second place at the moment. Uh, no surprises, it is four o'clock on a Friday for those of you uh, based in the UK. And in terms of that second question on whether you've bought something um, 
where a company has promised to plant a tree on your behalf, about so over two thirds of you have had uh, that promise made to you when you've, you've bought a product. Okay, so that's just a little bit of an icebreaker and we'll now move straight into the, the, the presentations. So delighted to hand over to our first speaker, Dr. Bonnie Waring. So uh, Dr. Dr. Waring, if you'd like to uh, take control of your slides and it's over to you. All right, well, thank you so much everyone for being here. Um, I'm excited to see all the interest in this topic today. So I'd like to start off by showing you two graphs that are likely quite familiar to you, both showing exponential curves. On the left-hand side, we have the precipitous rise in atmospheric carbon dioxide caused by human activity. And this, of course, changes our planet's climate. On the right, you see the exponential increase in species loss that has occurred since the start of the Industrial Revolution. So the climate and biodiversity crises are often discussed in isolation, but they're actually deeply intertwined. These crises share a common root driver. They amplify one another's effects. And happily, and what will be the focus of our discussion today, they can be addressed using the same basic toolbox of approaches. And so that's what I'd like to focus on. I'm going to start by discussing some of the ways and that human modification of the entire planet in the so-called era of the Anthropocene has driven changes in our climate and loss of species across the globe. And many of these effects hinge on the need for a growing human population to feed itself. So of the 70% of the Earth's land surface that is habitable, the rest of it being underneath glaciers or incapable of supporting vegetation, fully 50% of that habitable land surface is devoted to food. It's under some sort of agricultural management, either to grow crops, vegetables, fruits, and grains, or to raise livestock. And this has had a transformative impact on the surface of our planet in so many ways. One of the most concerning of these impacts, of course, is the loss of biodiversity. All habitat that is currently used to grow food for our population was formerly in some other use, a forest, a grassland, a wetland. And it is the loss of habitat that is still the major driver of species losses today. So looking across different taxa, birds, reptiles, amphibians, mammals, and fish, for most of them, habitat loss is the largest driver of reduction in population sizes or sadly extinction of those species. I think that's commonly appreciated, but what most people don't know is that about a quarter of the greenhouse gas emissions produced by human activity don't result directly from fossil fuels. They result from farming, land use conversion, which often involves burning or clearing vegetation, converting it back to carbon dioxide. And then there's lots of other greenhouse gases emitted in the process of managing land for agricultural use, applying fertilizer, raising organisms like cows and other ruminants that directly emit greenhouse gases. So in the graph here, I'm showing you sources of greenhouse gases from the start of the Industrial Revolution until present day. And the green is showing greenhouse gas emissions from land use change predominantly for agriculture, and the gray is showing uh, fossil fuel emissions. So you can see that land use change has accounted for a substantial chunk of our net climate forcing as a human species since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, and that continues right up into the present, where rates of deforestation globally show no sign of slowing. I'd also like to talk about the ways in which these two crises, both climate change and biodiversity loss, not only responds to the same human interventions, but also amplify one another's effects. And this is one of the most sobering figures that I, as a scientist, know of. This graph is accumulating all of our knowledge about uh, the relationship between warming of our planet's surface and species loss. So each dot is a different study estimating species extinction rates at a given degree of warning. And what you can see is that there is an exponential increase in the predicted rate of extinction as we continue to heat our planet. If we allow the temperature to rise four degrees above the pre-industrial level, we are looking at an extinction rate of one in six species with which we currently share the planet. And again, these problems, climate change and biodiversity loss, directly impact our species and our way of life. 
So there's a lot of conversation in the news about the negative impacts of climate change, and many of these are very readily perceptible. Things like extreme storms that destroy people's houses, heat waves that directly threaten people's health, the spread of diseases due to changes in the climate and migration of disease causing organisms, even things like famine and conflict over resources because of the ways in which we're changing our climate. These are all very tangible to us. But what we don't as often perceive is the fact that our survival as a species is very dependent on the biodiversity of the planet that we live on. So a huge amount of scientific effort has gone into demonstrating over and over again that the more diverse a given ecosystem is, the better it is able to provide critical services that support humanity. Now, some of these ecosystem services are quite obvious. We still directly extract food and fuel from natural ecosystems. But a lot of these services are so-called regulating services, things like the cooling effect that a forest can have locally the way it can trap water in the local atmosphere regulating precipitation cycles, the filtration effect of pollutants uh, in the groundwater. So all of these services, many of which directly help us uh, adapt to the effects of climate change are contingent upon preserving biodiversity. Now, because the climate and biodiversity crises are so closely related, I think that actually offers us a tremendous amount of hope because there are strategies that can tackle both crises at once with a single intervention. And one of the most powerful of these is protecting and restoring natural ecosystems. So plants are basically a miracle. They're nature's carbon dioxide capture machines. When we restore a forest, when we restore a grassland or a wetland, the growth of plants in that restored ecosystem starts absorbing carbon dioxide, mitigating climate change. But the creation of new habitat also uh, provides hope for the conservation of the species which depend upon that habitat type. So this uh, time series photo here is showing how quickly we can restore um, a mangrove ecosystem. This particular example happens to be, but restoration ecologists all over the world are working out how best to restore different types of habitat, ranging from forest to grassland to peatlands. So the three speakers that follow me today are going to discuss three different angles of this nexus between biodiversity and the climate crisis. We're going to start off by talking about ecosystem restoration, how this can deliver win-win outcomes for the climate and for people. Then we're going to be talking about the nature-based carbon offset mechanisms that can fund some of these projects. And finally, we're going to take a step back and think about the even bigger picture context in which this all sits, how we balance our need to feed our population, to clothe and house ourselves, to use the land for purposes that support the human endeavor, and how we balance this with preserving land for nature and mitigating climate change. And so without further ado, I'd like to hand off to the next speaker. Thank you so much for your attention, and we look forward to answering all of your questions. Thanks, Bonnie. Hopefully I can move the slides. Okay. Yeah, great. So hi, everyone. As, as Bonnie was saying, um, I am going to be talking about ecosystem restoration and as one of the many solutions we have to the global environmental crisis. So as some of you, of you may know, uh, we are now in the UN decade for ecosystem restoration. Uh, and the decade defines ecosystem restoration as the process of halting and reversing degradation, which results in improved ecosystem services and recovered biodiversity. So in very basic terms, restoration is a process that stops ecosystem degradation and allows ecosystems to recover either by their own means or with human help. We can restore most types of ecosystems and, and Bonnie has taught touched already on this. Um, from the lowlands to the highlands, we can restore grasslands, shrublands, savannas, and forests. But we can also restore aquatic ecosystems, such as rivers and fresh water, but also coastal ecosystems and, and other marine ecosystems. We can even restore ecosystems that have a higher human influence. Uh, farmlands, for example, can be restored through changes to management that improve soil health, or through the creation of habitats within the farm that house pollinators or other species that control the pets, the pests that our crops have. 
We can even restore urban spaces, making our cities, villages, and towns more biodiverse and adaptable to climate change, but also healthier for us and, and for our, our well being. I let's stop moving. Okay, great. Maggie control. Um, so why do we do ecosystem restoration? We do it because it has many benefits. Um, recovering ecosystems can contribute to climate change mitigation by capturing carbon from the atmosphere and storing it in their biomass and soils. They also contribute, contribute to, to climate change adaptation. So for example, oyster reefs in coastal areas reduce the impact of storms by reducing the energy of, of waves, et cetera. Uh, but tree covers in cities also clean the air and, and make our cities cooler. Um, restore ecosystems also increase biodiversity, but the benefits don't stop there. The, we get flood control from ecosystems, we get water and food security, uh, we get economic benefits and also health and, and well-being uh, benefits. Um, just to show you some examples, uh, the picture you're seeing now is of the river uh, Manzanares in Madrid, Spain. Ooh. And and um, and yeah, so this river in the past, um, well, in the past in the river, they built a set of gates and dams to hold the water back which destroyed destroy the natural flow of the river and the ecosystems uh, that were there. But since 2016, which is a picture you, um, you can see on, on, the, um, on the right, the dams ha have been kept open, open permanently, allowing the river to, to flow naturally again and for the vegetation to come back. And, and with that, the wildlife is also coming back. Um, I think not long ago, there, there was some news of otters were, um, walking around the river. So, you know, really, really iconic wildlife in the middle of, of the Spanish capital. Another example is the Instituto Terra in, in, uh, in Brazil. Um, this used to be a, a cattle farm, but the son, the son of the owners, uh, who is a famous photographer, Sebastião Salgado, decided to bring the forest back. And as you can see in the, in the pictures, in the, space, in the space of 20 years, the forest hover cover has increased massively. And, and with it, the plant biodiversity and, and animals. Even rivers that had gone dry within the property are now uh, flowing again, thanks to the restoration, which is just amazing. Um, but restoration doesn't need to be massive in scale. Uh, we can do we can do it in farmlands. So, for example, flower strips like you, the one you can see on the picture, can be a haven for pollinators and and other species. Uh, but even gardens can can be made more ecologically functional, functional and wildlife friendly. So, if you have one, you can. There's tons of resources out there that can help you make your garden um, a haven for for wildlife. Um, so, we. We've uh, established that restoration is great, but there's definitely show some cautions to think about. The first one of them is that restoration is not a silver bullet solution to, to all the global environmental crisis. Um, for it to be successful, we still need to quickly decarbonize our, and detoxify our activities. Um, it should also never become an excuse to stop protecting um, old and disturbed ecosystems. These are the best um, stores of biodiversity and carbon that we have. And if we lose them, we will lose them, we will lose part of their benefits for, for the long term. This restoration takes a long time to recover them. We also need to realize that where and when the right conditions exist, natural regeneration is the cheapest and most effective way of restoring ecosystems. It is also very important to acknowledge that restoration in general is a long term process. For example, many forest restoration efforts today measure success in terms of trees planted, but how many of those do actually survive? Does the, for does the forest establish? We should probably think in more, be thinking more about those things when we think about restoration success. And finally, as anything, when done badly, restoration can have negative impacts on climate, biodiversity, water, and people. Um, uh, and 
Yeah, just to finish off, the UK is a great example of how important it is to plan restoration well. Um, so what you're seeing on the screen is the results of a recent study and where they look at they looked at peatland restoration, woodland and salt mass, salt marsh creation, and their potential for climate change mitigation. And what they found was really interest, interesting. According to their models, um, restoring those three ecosystems would only capture three years worth of UK, UK emissions at current levels by 2100. This shows that the potential for ecosystem for ecosystems for climate change mitigation in the UK is modest, and that we should probably uh, that in this country probably we should be focusing more on the benefits of of, of of the biodiversity benefits of restoration and in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The study also showed that where restoration happens will be crucial. Um, the map on the right shows you the potential for woodland creation. Um, and although it's very conservative, um, and it, it excludes uh, things like higher quality agricultural land, uh, existing woodlands priority, and priority habitats, it shows that there, there's lots of potential to the space for, for new woodlands. However, um, the, the areas in red show you, show you places where creating woodlands might result in more emissions than those that are absorbed by the, by the growing woodlands. Um, perhaps one of the most important findings of this study was that peatlands are key for, for uh, restoration in the UK from a climate change perspective. Um, if we don't restore wood, uh, peatlands, right, the, the amount of emissions that we'll produce won't, won't, won't be upset by the new woodlands that, that we restore. So yeah. Peatlands are key on the agenda. And, and finally, one thing that the study highlights, and, I, and that is also really important to think about when, when doing restoration, is that the types of forests we create and how we manage them is, is fundamental. Um, in general, in the UK, for example, native broad, broadleaf woodlands managed for conservation are the best solution in terms of, of climate change mitigation. The study didn't look at biodiversity, but that's probably the case for that too. Um, and, and with this, I, this is the end of my presentation. I'll pass it on to, to Emily, who will be speaking to you about offsets. Thanks so much for that. I didn't, can I just get a nod if you can hear me okay and see the screen? Yep. Okay. Cool, thanks so much. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about voluntary carbon offsets and what they are, why we've got here and what might be the risks. What we've heard is some huge benefits of uh, restoring and protecting our biodiversity for all sorts of reasons and, and some potential risks from that. So winding back a little bit, voluntary carbon offsets come in several types. Some of them are nature-based solutions, and I would put those in two categories. One is protecting nature and one is restoring nature. There are another couple of categories that you'll find online, and one is educational and social programs um, to help less industrialized nations or less affluent regions and nations adapt and move forward through um, sustainable development goals. And another would be to help fund low carbon energy technologies such as solar or um, wind or cook stoves and those sorts of things, which are a hybrid and do a few different things. So what qualifies as voluntary carbon offset is a little bit up for debate. And there is some work in the UK from the Oxford University, the Oxford Principles, and then there's a coalition in UK for the different universities, the Carbon Coalition, and they have defined really what might be considered the highest quality carbon, voluntary carbon offsets. And I say voluntary because there's also a compulsory element under the United Nations framework for climate, convention on climate change, um, where huge emitters have to undertake buying offsets. The voluntary carbon offset market is really for the likes of me and you, who we might be sitting um, at our desks feeling guilty about what we've done, totting up our carbon footprint and thinking what to do about it. So it's not letting me move my slide forward yet. Let's see if that does. Oh, it's not gone backwards, sorry. Super sensitive screen, mouse. Here we go. In a moment, 
we will get back to my slides. If it helps, the arrow keys might be less, might be okay in terms of. Yeah, the stuff. arrow keys aren't working at all, sadly. So I'm having to be oh, gone right back to the beginning. <laughs> There we go. It might be better for me to do it without. They're mostly just pretty pictures of people and plants. Um, I'm going to just stay there. Yeah. So, Babs, uh, if, if Connor, if you could take back over the slides and then if you could progress for Emily. Uh, through. Talks, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Super. Uh, so, the slide he's about to show you is of my daughter standing, there we go, in front of the Alps. And the reason that I've put this up is my daughter's currently sitting with a dilemma we're all going to face. So she's been invited on trip of a lifetime for free uh, off to southern Spain for a holiday. She's finished her A-levels. She's been through lockdown. It's time for her to kind of catch up with life a bit and have some fun. However, she looked at getting the bus and the train, which involves crossing Madrid, possibly in the middle of the night on her own, very tired. And even though I've been campaigning on climate change for decades, I encouraged her, to, if she's going to go, to fly. So the question for me in this situation isn't whether to offset or not. It's are there other things that you can do prior to that conversation in your head? Can you not go at all? Can you go through a different route? Can you go through a different mode of transport? And these dilemmas are going to face us all even more as we go forwards. And this is what we call the mitigation hierarchy. So whether or not you offset is right at the bottom of the decision-making tree. The first things to think about are, is there a way to not do this activity? Is there a way to do it in the lowest carbon option first? And if all of those is a no, it, well, if it's a yes, you have to do it. And it's a no, you can't do it any other way. Then the offset for me is a, is a foregone conclusion decision. Do you offset or not? Then it's about how you do it, what you do it, where you do it, who you buy from, because not all offsets are equal, to quote a um, very famous uh, George Orwell book. So the um, problem with offsets is that, yes, they hold, it's like a hammer. You could build a bridge or you can break a bridge with a hammer, and it is how they're used and what the intention is behind it. Generally, with the um, biodiversity nature-based solutions, you do have these opportunities, for these huge win-wins. If we just go forwards one slide, please. But there are also some risks. So this guy, uh, the UN patron of the ocean, is used to managing risks. And I wanted to include this slide for two other reasons. One is to invite us all to not look away. Yeah, this is really difficult and these decisions are going to be hard and it's too hot to hold sometimes. But every now and then we have to pick it up and look at it and think if he can do this, then we can grapple with some of these really difficult dilemmas that we're facing and make some really tough decisions. Sometimes it will mean not going on that holiday if the only thing to do is to fly and it's frivolous. Um, the other reason I wanted to have this slide in is we talk about habitat restoration and protection. The most important habitat in the world, in my view, in terms of climate change is sea ice. This isn't actually at the North Pole, this one. This, this man's famous for swimming at the North Pole. This photo is in the Antarctic Ocean, where we set, helped set up the um, big marine protected area in the Ross Sea, which will count for naught if we don't stop climate change. And if we don't save the sea ice, particularly in the Arctic, the genie will be out of the bottle and the cork will be out of the top of the champagne and all the gases will come out. So there are some habitats that serve different functions and sea ice is one of the ones that's just overlooked. So if you look at a strength, weakness, opportunity, threat analysis for uh, voluntary carbon offsets, you get all sorts of difficulties popping up that are unexpected. And if we see the next slide, thank you, we will see, feeling like Chris Whitty, we will see, this is a, a photo I took in Wales, went to sheepdog trials, just stumbled across it and look at that hillside. That hillside would have been dense with rich, mature woodland as its climate community. What we have now in the UK is one of the most deforested na uh, nations in the world. And it's shocking. We just don't even realize how much we've lost. And restoring our habitats from sea ice to forests, mangroves, seagrasses, wetlands, kelp forests, we, ha we have so much to gain. 
if it's done well. But there are real problems. And this is a reminder that one of the stories that I've heard of is um, investment banks in London being paid to buy up Welsh farms at a sniff of a price to be then paid to plant trees to then be paid to sell the offsets. And what it means is that local farmers are no longer able to buy uncle whoever's farm and it's pushing people out of their own lands and we know the historic issues around that and this is going to be a global issue and we have to be really careful about making sure that carbon offsets are regulated so on our next slide what we have is a photo I took at the UN um, Food and Agriculture Organization's Committee on Food Security where all of the different agendas are at the table and I would advocate the UNFCCC is not the most functional instrument that I've ever seen used for negotiations. This one actually is a bit more fleet of foot and acts faster. Whatever the regulation mechanism we're going to use for carbon offsets, um, it needs to be really functional and it needs to be fast and involving business as well as civil society organisations. And if we have the last slide, please, I'm really conscious of time, so I'm going super fast. <laughs> um, so here, this, this is a project I set up several years ago, and it was to plant orchards throughout any communal lands that we could engage people with in the communities to, to plant fruit and nuts that would be climate savvy. Because one of the things about habitat restoration for me, and it's really important in afforestation projects, is to make sure that what we're creating isn't just a replica of what we've lost. It needs to be ready to deal with the climate that is coming towards us, um, that we are ourselves creating the new changes in the climate. It needs to be smart. And the reason that this slide is particularly significant for me is this is part of the 350 parts per million campaign. You know, we started at 270. We're now over 400. Even getting down to 350 is going to be hard, but we know from the IPCC we have to go into net negative emissions. And we've, we've known that for decades, that we need to go into net negative emissions. And whether we want to get to net zero or whether we want to take responsibility for our historic emissions, um, these sorts of conversations about our level of ambition are going to influence our decision about what types of carbon offsets we undertake and how many. There isn't enough land in on Earth to draw down all of those fossil fuels because it was historic it's um the the fossil fuels have come from deep in the earth but the most important part of this picture that i wanted to describe to you was the the every time you look at a piece of pizza or a cake i want you to think about this image with all of the different slices of this parachute biodiversity is important human rights are important water conservation is important Animal welfare is important. All of these different elements that come together in habitat protection and biodiversity, all of them belong at the table. Um, and unless they're all considered, we can come out with suboptimal sub solutions um, and end up trading off the different pieces of this um, ecosystem, the global ecosystem that we have against one another. And what I would encourage us to do when we're buying carbon offsets or looking at habitat restoration is to look for those win-win-wins that help deliver all of the sustainable development goals and more. They're not the only things that we need to keep our eye on. Um, so thank you so much. This is Diochenvar in Welsh and a reminder of the immense capacity of the ocean to absorb heat and carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. Thank you so much. And I'm going to pass over to Tilly. Thank you, Emily. And, and you've touched on many things that we can do because we really do have to start acting. And, and a lot of what I'm going to say here is taken from the point of view that most of us now live in cities. Of course, many people do live rurally, but across the world, the majority of people are now city dwellers and we've become slightly disconnected from nature in many ways and we, we don't really feel as much about the preciousness of nature and we're beginning to understand really that, that we must do something. And the first thing that we can do really is to be modest, is to 
is to think about our consumption. And Emily's touched on this when talking about her daughter, how you take your decisions, how you think about what you're going to do. You have to consider your consumption. Uh, you have to think about recycling. You have to think about reusing. And we just have to take the time slightly to, to be modest in our ambitions and modest in our behavior, just down to things like using less product. And my daughters get through the most extraordinary amount of shampoo. And I'm constantly saying just use less. But all those things, using less water, using less energy, help beyond our households. Because if we use less and we eat better, and if we eat less meat and more plants, all those things have a knock-on effect to the carbon systems. We also have to to re-engage with nature. We have to, to acknowledge it when we see it and talk about it and, and promote contact with nature. We have to go to parks and begin to watch the seasons and plant seeds where you can so that you connect more readily with, us, with it. And this is just an example of a bit of a semi-abandoned land around the corner from where I live in Hammersmith, which is the most incredibly diverse place because it's largely been left alone. And then recently they've planted a little forest on it, which is going to add to the diversity of this site. So we've got a bit of grassland, we've got a bit of forest. And this site is enabling people to connect very much more naturally with the world around them. So it is important to connect because we know that connected people were well, connected with nature, advocate more, and they engage more. And it's really important to engage. So, so you can engage around you, you can engage with the kind of local green space design that there is around you. You, you can join groups that talk about how your green space is managed. This is a sub system on the White City Estate, which was designed to help absorb water to minimize what was going into the drain because the more water that goes into the drains, the, the greater the risk of overflow. And certainly in, we've been talking a lot recently about pollution from overflow events. So we need these, these green spaces designed into our cities in order to be able to, to manage water, to promote biodiversity. And that promotes our health and that reduces our impact on the world. There are all sorts of opportunities in cities that we're not taking advantage of. We, we need more green roofs. We're looking much more carefully at urban agriculture and what we can grow. There have been some studies recently that say that actually, you know, you can grow an awful lot in cities. And if you grow things in cities, then they don't have to travel so far. And maybe you only grow your kind of high value products on, on your balcony or on your windowsill. You may not grow potatoes on your windowsill, but if you grow some things, they promote your health. And the healthier we are, the less we weigh on the world, the, the less medication we need, the less hospitalization we need. All these things that are associated with green space are health promoting in so many ways. One thing we can do on a wider scale is really begin to advocate and to to advocate at all sorts of levels. We need to talk to kids when we see them. For scientists, we need to do outreach and promote biodiversity. We have to, to lend our voices to organizations which fight. So sometimes those are membership organizations, but together we, we have the ability to use our voices to shift systems. The, the capitalist business oriented system is quite hard to shift in behavior, but our voices really matter. And we also have to set good examples. We have to normalize behaviors. People are, are adjusting to using bicycles much more here because it's becoming normalized as a form of transport. Over lockdown, when, when you know, it was much more difficult to get around, many more people started walking. And many more people started using bicycles. It was impossible to buy a bicycle in London at one point. 
It, it, and people have got used to it. So when we normalize good behaviors, other people around us follow suit. But we can advocate in all sorts of ways. The Grantham Institute recently held a Grantham Art Prize in which scientists from Imperial went into schools and talked to people and worked with artists. The, these are pictures from Bryony Ben Jabbat, who was one of the artists the, that we worked with. And from that, the children designed murals that she then went on and painted. These were tied into to COP26. And a lot of people took real advantage of this engagement with nature. We, we rush in the world a lot. And along with behaving in a modest way, a really good thing to do is, as Emily touched on, is just to slow down and take time to think about how we live and what effects our lives have. And we need to develop our strategies so, so that we tread lightly. We need to invest sustainably and wisely, and we need to evaluate the decisions we take so that we can encourage change. Lots of the big changes need to come at the, the, the infrastructural level. They need to come at the government level. We need to be supporting the, the offset system and evaluating the offset system to make sure it's doing its job. We need at that level to be promoting ecosystem restoration and stopping devastating other ecosystems that remain intact. These are all things that we have to do and our voices can help drive those things forwards. At the same time, locally, our voices can help normalise better behaviours. And sometimes it's hard and sometimes we do have to take difficult decisions about our behaviours. But there is hope. Neil, I'm handing back to you on that. Thank you so much, Tilly. That's a wonderful uh, note to leave it on. And I was, I was thinking as you were talking about the need to take a step back and be a bit slower, like I think we all need to be a bit more sloth going back to the uh, images that we had at the very start. Um, right, we'll move on to some sort of questions now. So we had some submitted before as well. So I'll start off with a question uh, going initially to Bonnie and then, uh, then to Tilly. Um, and a couple of so related questions. So one is around... Um, uh kind of i suppose bearing in mind your slides bonnie considering that kind of the land use um conversion to agriculture is such an important driver of both species loss and also of climate change what do you think is the best way to reduce the agri agricultural footprint of a growing human population and the question that and then so if you could start on that bonnie and then maybe bridge into this but then probably hand over to tilly a question that came in from peter knapp was um with the inevitable food shortages how do we encourage and continue farming without pesticides or fertilizers? And maybe Tilly, when you answer that, if you could maybe bridge that and also challenge the question maybe as to whether it is a good idea and some of the consequences of, of, of reducing fertilizers that can have on biodiversity loss, you know, indirect impacts. So um, Bonnie, if you could go first and then hand over to Tilly. Sure. Uh, so there is one dietary change that has been shown over and over and over again to have the largest impact, not only on the amount of land we need to feed the human population, but how much greenhouse gas is emitted while we do it. And that is to decrease our reliance on meat. That does not mean that everybody has to be a vegetarian or a vegan. We can have a very large impact just by eating less of it, uh, using meat more as a flavoring and less as a main course three times a day. And the reason for that is because it takes much more land per unit calorie or per unit protein to produce uh, a given quantity of cow protein versus plant protein. It's because energy is lost as we move up the food chain from plants into um, the animals that we eat. And it's because many of the techniques we use to raise um, livestock uh, themselves produce greenhouse gas emissions. So that's a very simple thing that everybody can do. And again, it doesn't mean that you have to become um, uh, card carrying vegan it's just a question of reduction Great. thanks bonnie and if we go to, to tilly yes I, I don't think we're giving up pesticides and fertilizers yet but we can farm much more sensibly with them we can stop using them in a wildly prophylactic manner and only use them when we need to and that's been one of the big revolutions in farming that is really starting to happen is, is very much more precise application 
of the nasties. But we, we are using technology in all sorts of ways. And I have to say that the Brexit, the loss of manpower that we've had in our farming and in our countryside has driven a roboticization that is actually extremely precise in many ways. But we are relying on technology in different ways to have productive agriculture. And this, this is an, a really interesting area of change. We have a lot of opportunity in urban agriculture. And, and when we think of urban agriculture, we tend to think of allotments and we tend to think of kitchen gardens. But there's also extremely high-tech urban agriculture, which can produce salad leaves underground. And there's an enormous push towards this in Paris where they're using ex-underground car parks in many ways to, to have well-lit, renewable energy, of course, hydroponic systems that produce incredible quantities of salad leaves that then don't travel very far to the user. So we can use technology in agriculture. We can use that kind of intensification. Uh, the great advantage, well, another great advantage of those, those controlled systems in that way is you don't need pesticides because the pests just don't get there. So we have the opportunity in the countryside to have a less pesticide and less prophylactic use, but we also have an opportunity in increased technology we need to make better use of our waste. And I'm a great advocate of eating insects that have been raised on agricultural waste. That's where we should be getting our protein from. Right, thanks, Tilly. And uh, Emily, would you like to come in on that at all? Thanks so much. Because I used to work at the um, Committee on Food Security. One of the things that shocked me that we can all help with is um, in, in southern farming nations, about a third of our crops are lost on the farm because of pests and losses and wastes and about in industrialized nations about a third of our food is lost in the household to food waste we do produce enough food to feed uh, the world we don't distribute it well so there are some big wins that can be gained there as well I, I absolutely agree with the previous two comments as well thanks Thanks, Emily. And uh, and sorry, sorry, Pete. I um, appreciate you got your hand up, but I'm um, just in the interest of, of getting through some of the other questions. I'm afraid we weren't able to take um, questions, but we do have one uh, for you, Alvaro, um, from uh, Emilien. Um, so, relating to your the the three percent um, stat in terms of your the oh sorry three years um, stat in terms of the carbon capture. So the uh, uh, question is, um, oh, you can probably see it, but I'll, I'll read it out. Um, so restoring nature in the UK could capture only three years worth of UK emissions. Biodiversity benefits aside, sounds rather futile. Uh, what did I miss? So maybe you'd like to elaborate on that. So, um, sorry, I don't, I don't know if I understood the, the, the question correctly. So futile in... Um, I think in, in relatively small amount of carbon emissions, I think was being suggested. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean... I think that's that's one of the main findings uh, on that study and, and one that's like um, the biggest shocker. Like it, it seems like lots of governments and, and not only in the UK, like worldwide, put a lot of uh, emphasis on on restoring uh, particularly forests. Uh, but, you know, studies like this show that the potential for um, for mitigation from those forests is, is not that massive. Uh, particularly if we keep emitting at the current levels we're, we're doing it, or if we omit restoring certain ecosystems like peatlands, which if, you know, they, if they degrade, the amount of emissions they produce is, is just uh, uncontrollable uh, with, with restoration of other ecosystems. So, so yeah, it's a, it's a bit, um, it's not futile, we need to do it because restore, like biodiversity, um, biodiversity we, we also, it also can help with flood control uh, but yeah, climate, particularly for the UK, is probably not the main point of frustration. Yeah, yeah, I think those co-benefits are kind of the things which come out more strongly from that. But I guess you know the, the, the bottom line is demand side reduction in the first place, uh, and and then um, you know uh, working out where we can actually you know and that three percent clearly gets or three, sorry three years equivalent clearly gets bigger the more we reduce the the, the rest of our uh, actual emissions that are going up into the air in yeah. the first place in terms of the proportion so really emphasizes the need to do more but also the important role that nature can play in adapting to a warmer climate as well as well as yeah. as, as yeah. has been touched on for the speakers access to nature being so key to our to our, our well-being 
Okay, um, so maybe just a, a kind of a specific question. I'm, I'm thinking maybe of coming to you for this one, Tilly. So this is around the kind of use of rooftops for, for gardens and, and indeed for, for trees and the kind of way in which we can integrate that, particularly, I suppose, into our urban, urban areas. I, I absolutely think we should. I mean, we need solar panels on roofs as well, but we probably need solar south-facing <laughs> walls. We, we have an opportunity to use roofs in all sorts of ways, and we're not doing it yet. So, so for biodiversity, it doesn't matter whether it's terribly high in the air, as long as it's green. So lots of the, the early efforts really just left rubble on roofs and as, as kind of grey brown roofs and have become extraordinarily biodiverse. But recently we've been really getting into farming on roofs and that has huge potential for making a proper productive use of, of urban areas. So yes, absolutely. Put them all, <laughs> pile it up, grow things on your roofs, take over your roofs. Excellent, thanks Tilly. And um, so I'll, I'll go to a question that came in early on, just because I think it's probably one that's been on people's minds more, more, more generally. Is that, and this is a kind of a wider question around climate and the climate action in the context of what we're seeing uh, in Ukraine at the moment in terms of well, the impact on global, global plans for action on climate change. It's a quite a broad question, but I wonder if we could come to, I don't know, um, maybe uh, Emily, if you might be interested in taking this question first and some thoughts on the kind of impacts that the, the Ukraine um, war may have upon climate action. Thanks. Uh, slightly random fielding towards me, but there is something I wanted to say on this, actually, in terms of I did some work when I worked on worked at WWF on climate portfolios and how we might meet our climate needs and targets. I think our needs are much greater than our targets on climate change and revisiting the topic that's come up as a consequence of the Ukraine war um, invasion from Russia is whether to revisit nuclear. And I would say from a biodiversity perspective, that would be utterly disastrous. One of the things that's usually squashed, and I did my master's thesis on this, was that nuclear power stations kill a lot of fish. And I mean a lot of fish. I tried to explain it to the people at WWF and I couldn't write enough noughts on the wall. So in the Southern North Sea, it's equivalent to the amount of fish that are killed in the southern north sea by large by nuclear power station cooling systems is equivalent to half of the uk fishing fleet in that region it's a lot of fish that die in those cooling systems so in terms of biodiversity wind farms might kill a few birds i can't begin to explain how many fish and seals um, and plankton nuclear kill so this can be an opportunity and at the moment it does seem to be being an opportunity to revisit planning laws that have held back onshore um, wind farms. Offshore, th that's the fastest way to return on investment in terms of the carbon investment and the financial investment to get low carbon energy produced, and it creates a lot of jobs. Um, solar uses is quite high intensity, but also creates a lot of jobs, uh, intensity of energy to produce and some nasty chemicals. Onshore wind is super fast. It pays back its carbon investment in months. Offshore is a bit more expensive, uh, takes a little bit longer to pay back the carbon. Nuclear is unquantifiably expensive and has a huge upfront carbon investment because of the concrete that's used. So yeah, this is a turning point for all the wrong reasons. And we've been saying it for decades, get off Russian oil. There you go, I mean, that's why I came to you. <laughs> um, so th th thank you very much. I'm sure that, I mean, that, that I have to admit, I wasn't uh, aware of the, the sort of biodiversity impact that nuclear had. And I think one of the things which you, which you touched on there as well, which I think is, you know, obviously it's a ho horrible situation the response from the EU and from the UK seems to be, as, you, as you're alluding to, say this is, a, this is a reason, another push for us to get energy independence and to do that via a combination of shifting away from expensive gas, expensive oil, to become more in independent by having ge more generation of renewables in our own country. But specifically, I think as, as far as the, the people aspect of stuff goes, the real need to get energy efficiency sorted out. So we actually have to use less energy in the first place. I think if this is a horrible situation, but hopefully it can push us for more climate action there is a risk that it can distract us clearly away from um climate action but it has to has to not do it has to push us down the energy independence route um i'm just conscious of, of time and, and the need to finish on time so if we just finish off with a very quick round of everyone um just to give a kind of 
a brief reflection. It might be something you've covered off already, but maybe starting with Bonnie and going through in the order you went through the speakers, you know, touching on one thing that you would like those who've attended today's session to take away from the session. So Bonnie first. Sure. Well, we have a limited amount of land on Earth at our disposal, and land has to serve three basic needs. We need to feed ourselves, we need to provide habitat for the other species that share our planet, and we can also use it to mitigate the climate. Because there is not unlimited land, and because these crises are so severe, I would say we need to ensure that each parcel of land is doing at least two of those things at once. So that means farming has to be climate friendly and or biodiversity friendly and so on and so forth. If you can keep that in mind when you're choosing projects to support or what you consume, I think that's a great rule of thumb. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Bonnie. Uh, Alvaro. So I think I would like to highlight that ecosystem restoration is way more than tree planting. It seems that that is um, what, you know, is like the automatic thing we all think about when we think about ecosystem restoration. And the second thing I would like to highlight is that we need to plan it really carefully. We need to think about where we're doing it, why we're doing it, and when we're doing it, and also who is affected by it. People are key to the success of this in the long term. Absolutely. Thank you, Avaro. And Emily? Thanks. I'm going to pick up on one of the questions, if possible, please, which was about population. Um, and just to draw this distinction that population is almost high areas of high population are almost the opposite of high areas of consumption. And touching back to what Tilly said, live simply so that others can simply live. Excellent, thank you. So and that's, that's a very clear message. So I think that for me, it's essentially be modest, think and, and make the sacrifices we need to make so that we have a long-term chance of getting a world that will last for the children that we have and their grandchildren. Thank you, Tilly. Thank you for such powerful calls for action. I also would direct those of you who have not been checking already to the, to the chat. There's um, calls, for example, from, from Pete in terms of opportunities to connect. I know, Tilly, in your, in your presentation, you spoke about the need to connect and that connection exists at a whole variety of different levels, connection to nature, connection to those around us and that kind of um, that modesty and I think empathy is, is a really important key theme that needs to come out in terms of us being sympathetic to each other and also taking action together. That's something that absolutely needs to happen. So, um, but just to, to bring the session to a close, uh, apologies if you weren't able to get to, to your questions. Um, um, I will just highlight an, uh, one more event that's taking place. This is the, the last day of Sustainability Week. The last event is tonight for any of you who are on the South Kensington campus at the moment. There's a screening of a BBC documentary at half past six and the link for that will be posted in the chat um, very shortly. Um, just like to say a massive thank you to the panellists today for their time in preparing for today's session and for all of their insights. Really fascinating and uh, I'm sure all of you are very appreciative of, of the time they've given. So thank you so much. Um, big thanks to everyone behind the scenes um, who's helped to bring this event to, together. So specifically Hannah, Connor, Ria and Siobhan. And finally, many thanks for all of you for giving up some of your Friday to, to join us today. I hope you've enjoyed the event. I hope you have a fantastic uh, uh, weekend and, um, and take care and stay safe. Bye everyone.